and welcome everyone. Today we will be giving you an inside look at the workings of the Oxford Blue, the first new paper at the university in 30 years. I'm Eve McMullen. And I'm Andrew Smales, and today we'll be talking to Blue Editors-in-Chief Gabby and Bria, as well as Managing Director Adam. Thank you so much for joining us today, guys. Just to start off with, could each of you outline for our viewers what your roles at the Oxford, what are your roles at the Oxford Blue, and what you're in charge of? I'm Gabby, um, and Bria and I edit the paper, which means we're in charge of all of the content that goes out. Um, so essentially just making sure that all the sections are publishing the things that matter and the way that they're meant to be published. Um, we're also in charge of uh, holding a weekly meeting with the senior editors to answer any of their questions and see what they've been getting up to in the week uh, and making sure everything's okay with their teams. If there's any kind of crisis point, we manage that with Adam um, and our board of directors, I guess. Those are our main responsibilities I think. Yeah I think Gabby's sort of covered most of it. Um, I just also say that we're sort of in charge for like the broad broader creative vision for the paper so like you know what do we want to focus on going forward in the term? Um, are there any you know if there's any projects that we want to work on or grow the paper in that's sort of what we're in charge of for the term. Yeah, um, which I guess leaves me. Hi, I'm Adam, I'm the MD, um, which I guess means practically I head up the business team. Um, in addition to, yeah, broadly sort of making sure the paper functions as an organisation. So yeah, where the overlap lies, uh, as opposed to, to the editor in chief is a very good question. But um, broadly speaking, between the three of us, we try and make sure the thing runs. So. Brilliant. Uh, a question for Gabby. Uh, there are, of course, several historic student publications at the university. What do you think makes the blue different to the other Oxford papers that have come before it and what sort of gaps in the market, as it were, does it fill? Good question. Um, so the blue was founded in January of this year, so it's nearly a year old, um, essentially to shake up the journalism world at Oxford. Um, the founders believed that newspapers weren't being very innovative um, and that there was this kind of I don't know, staleness maybe is probably the best way to describe it um, among the journalists and the journalism scene here. So the blue is essentially like, I, I like to think of it as like the home of journalistic um, innovation in Oxford. Um, and in practice, that means that we're the first uh, online only platform in Oxford. We don't run a print. Um, which means that we can deliver faster news. It also means like we're not wasting a load of paper, which is always nice. Um, and I think I think everyone receives their news via the internet nowadays. So it's, it's keeping up with the times and making sure that journalism in Oxford remains relevant um, to its readers, which is at the end of the day, why we do it. Um, yeah, I don't know if you guys have anything to add about why. Why we're, why we're different? Yeah, I think I'd also just add the fact that um, we're a sort of a training paper. So a lot of the people who come and join the Oxford Blue or who have, um, have no experience in student journalism, which is, you know, people starting university generally tend not to have any experience with it, you know, unless your, your high school or your secondary school had one, um, which means that sort of everyone's getting to grips with the skills that you need as a student journalist. Um, there's loads of new ideas because people don't really have anything from the past to go on. Um, but it, it, it just means that everyone's sort of learning together and bouncing sort of ideas off each other in that respect. Brilliant, thank you. Great, thanks for that. So I've got a question for Bria now. Um, it can sometimes seem like we live in a bit of a bubble in Oxford. Uh, or at universities in general. So I guess in that context, what do you think the role and the relevance of student journalism actually is? Okay, I definitely agree that, you know, Oxford feels like a bubble a lot of the time. Um, and, you know, you're right as well, universities in general, because we're all sort of in this very intense space where our, our studies and what's going on in Oxford feels really important. But, and so student journalism does have a responsibility to inform students of what's going on 
in their town, at their university, the policies in their departments which are affecting them, um, we should report on those. Um, but I think it also stands to place students in sort of a wider cultural conversation. Um, I think recently with COVID that's been made very clear, you know, we're not just, so students don't just sit in these universities towns and have no relation to what's going on outside of that in terms of politics or um, in terms of you know, anything else that's going on in the broader world. So uh, I think we have a responsibility to sort of make, you know, broader news outlets aware of, of what a student voice has to offer. Um, so in, I think that's what it means in that respect. But then on the other hand as well, student journalism has a responsibility to help students voice their own opinions. You know, we're not just a news outlet. We're also, um, we also publish opinion and it's a place for students to discuss the cultural conversations that are going on um, to, you know, to, to, to say what their opinions are on the things that affect them outside of university. I guess I'd just add to that as well, to be honest, that we, uh, I, I, so, so the British journalism in particular, but more broadly, I guess, sort of journalism in the Western world tend to be dominated by quite like a, a specific range of people insofar as it tends to be those who went to private schools, um, you know, nepotism is a major issue. Uh, and, and broadly speaking, the idea that anyone, um, you know, you know, the best journalists don't, you know, people with people the most potential, you know, the best journalists like the best, uh, you know, most aspiring people don't necessarily always get um, the chance they deserve. And I, I guess so us, uh, as a paper in particular, but sort of as a student paper, you know, within the broader sort of journalism scene more generally, it's sort of our role to um, provide a platform for people who maybe necessarily otherwise wouldn't get the opportunity to experience journalism firsthand. I sort of build some journalism into a CV and more broadly give them sort of the uh, the knowledge and the skills they'd need to sort of uh, uh, consider journalism as a career uh, more broadly and sort of yeah consider um, you know journalism as something that is is you know not just for the few but genuinely for anyone who uh, just has you know the commitment and the drive and, and the passion to get involved and um, so sort of as a broader uh, as a paper that's something we focus on I think as, as a sort of a, a student publication certainly something that we, we sort of should do and do if that makes sense. Great that's really interesting thanks very much for that. Um, Adam, just pushing, you said a little bit more about journalism in the wider world and the sort of um, pushing on that. There's a the huge pressure to adapt and evolve rapidly in, in journalism at the moment, especially when it comes to sort of business models. Um, how has the blue as a paper, do you think, begun to change and expand to reflect that? Sure, yeah. So I, I guess sort of by our very sort of uh, foundation as an online organisation, that's sort of a reflection of of where the world is and where journalism is going, right? So, uh, you know, a big heavy print operation comes with significant costs uh, and comes with sort of, you know, significant uh, restrictions. I think sort of Bria talked about already uh, in terms of, you know, just uh, restricting how we do, how quickly we can respond to news uh, and the sort of, you know, the uh, either the, you know, the, the funding that we need to secure, either through sort of putting, you know, quite you know, significant sponsorship and sort of throwing that uh, um, at readers through our platforms or, uh, sort of more broadly, you know, just through you know, looking to compromise our independence in some way by securing large amounts of money from uh, from other sources in ways that say some organisations choose to take uh, taking you know, paid content, for example. Uh, and so the Ox and Blues response to that has been a little bit different in that we've sort of taken the approach that we want, we sort of, you know, we value our independence uh, as such. And so we basically have a sort of a very minimal footprint, which allows us A, to uh, obviously, in terms of uh, sort of re any rapid responses to breaking news, etc., uh, sort of you know produce you know whatever people can at whatever given time we can put out as quickly as possible. Um, but also, yeah, in in terms of sort of that independence front, it also means that effectively we can uh, afford to run off sort of minimal sponsorship uh, and sort of sort of uh, and a least intrusive sort of uh, financial model possible as a means effectively ensuring that. Uh, yeah, um, word gets to the people and it is independent voices from within Oxford uh, and we don't need to compromise that necessarily um, and you break these sort of key principles as a paper we're founded upon uh, for the sake of sort of financial realities whereby, you know, attracting funding is increasingly difficult. So uh, I, I guess um, that's the broader picture in the pandemic more specifically, um, you know, 
uh, we've sort of built, we've built more into online, we've moved to an events online, etc. as a means of sort of making sure that even, you know, uh, the world notwithstanding, the blue will go on, um, uh, which is sort of, I guess, the, the sort of our responsibility as people sort of running the paper. Um, and yeah, I don't know, I, I guess uh, expanding this term, we, we've taken on a large number of, uh, of sort of first year students and tried to sort of build in uh, training of them in, in sort of as a, as soon as they get to university as part of our, our broad sort of commitment to sort of rec rec uh, recruitment and, uh, and uh, you know, giving everyone access more broadly. Um, and sort of, yeah, I, ev every, every time you're gonna get a new team, it's gonna look to put its new spin on it, but we sort of, uh, I've been, been been looking to try and make sure the paper is accessible as possible and that's sort of uh you know the 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 something that we hope we will continue beyond us and i'm sure will uh but i couldn't possibly comment on what the next team will do in the uh in, in the coming terms i'm sure they'll come up with their own spin their own unique ways of of fulfilling the missions of the team brilliant thank you um i've got a question for gabby now so as adam indicated earlier uh, the blue was founded as a paper which would be more open and it would encourage a greater range of students to get involved in student journalism so what i want to draw on is do you think that there's even more going forward that the blue could be doing to fulfill the same i mean i guess first it's good to establish what we've done already so we run a series of master classes which are meant to equip writers with the skills um, needed to, I guess, refine their art and their voice um, by being able to engage with professionals um, and some really big names in the in the field and in the real world. Um, so they've been really popular in the past. And as far as I'm aware, the Blue will continue to run those um, right through the year um, and probably further into the future. Um, we also have um, ensured that no one necessarily needs experience to come onto our paper um, and remove that barrier to being able to write and to being able to edit, which I think is really important. And I guess one of the most simple but effective ways we can ensure that anyone can come and get involved with us. Um, in terms of what we can do in the future, Bria and I have talked in the past about um, doing some more outreach work with schools um, and I'm not sure if maybe post our editorship we might actually find the time to make that happen um, just so that students who don't necessarily have access to a student paper at secondary school because of funding or like a lack of staff enthusiasm to make it happen um, can actually have some introduction to student journalism um, and kind of get insight into what we do so that when they get to university, there isn't that disparity between student experience in student papers um, and kind of a giving students the confidence to actually get involved in student societies, whether it be the paper or something else, um, because they've had that experience at school. So I think that's the thing that I'm most excited to kind of investigate and explore post our editorship. Great, thank you. Um, on another topic, so over the summer and lockdown, I've noticed quite a few student controversies popping off. Um, the current political climate has made student journalism potentially a more contentious activity than before. Um, Bria, I was wondering, where do you think the line should be drawn between someone's sort of legitimate expression of free speech and content um, and, and stuff that might be seen as offensive or inflammatory? Yeah, um, it's a tough one, but I think as I was saying earlier, media in general has such an important part to play, um, as we've seen, you know, in elections and politics, you know, and everything in sort of shaping cultural discourse and what's going on. And it's got a real, a really key role to play in sort of setting up the parameters for what is acceptable and what's not. Um, so as, as editors, you have a huge responsibility in deciding, you know, what sort of conversations are going to be happening both in your university and outside of it, because Oxford as a city and as a university is, a, you know, a lot of interests nationally speaking, whenever we break a story or whenever Oxford students do anything, people are interested in it. Um, so it's, it's a huge responsibility in, in that sense. Um, but in terms of where the line should be drawn, um, I think student journalism is, 
it's incredibly important to make sure it is still a place where people can have difficult conversations and can talk about issues that need to be talked about um, in you know a free and open way but at the same time I think student newspapers especially now um, have to put their foot down when uh, when things are you know openly or even subtly you know racist or homophobic or sexist um, and say and draw a line and say you know this is not as a culture or as a society this is not how we should be talking about x y or z um, you know and in some sense I think a lot of the time we can underestimate just how important media or journalism is in influencing those things but whether it's how you know a BBC news presenter or any news presenter is talking about a certain topic um, whether it's how you know the sort of language that an opinion piece uses or the sort of language that even, even news news articles especially it's really important that you keep an objective objective distance but it really does have an impact so the line is difficult to draw and you know we have these conversations on a weekly basis where we read an article and we have to make a decision about how it's talking about certain subjects or whether this is even a subject as students we should be talking about but it takes a lot of difficult conversations but um it, they're important decisions to make yeah absolutely i mean yeah just just to add to that we've got um we've got publicly available guidelines and what we will and won't publish um uh, which we sort of guide you know our us through that process effectively and should sort of guide people into sort of what we will consider publishing but at the same time yeah there is a certain level of sort of uh, subjectivity to every article that makes it sort of a really difficult conversation consistently to have uh, it's something that we you know inevitably good people will disagree on a lot of the time but uh if you know it's it's something that's sort of a key part of student journalism is sort of uh you know shaping student discourse so absolutely an important conversation that sort of cannot really be avoided mm -hmm. Um, I've got some questions for all of you now. Um, so what are the goals for the future uh, in all of your respective areas as to how the blue might continue to grow? And are there any exciting new projects that you might have in the pipeline that you could tell us a little bit about? Do you want us to go first? I'll go first. <laughs> um, so, hmm, goals we have for the future. I mean, Bria, Adam and I will be taking a step back from our roles at the end of this term, but still like remaining very much involved in the paper, which probably means that we'll have more time in terms of like what we want specifically from the paper. Um, and in terms of like growth, I think the things that we all feel really passionately about is increasing readership and increasing like diversity of content. So ensuring that the content we produce is representative of all student experience and not just that of the writer that's writing it. Um, so I think that's something that we will all continue to be invested in um, and how we promote the paper on various platforms, um, investigating what other platforms we can move to. Um, and just ensuring that that kind of culture of innovation continues to be present at the paper, because I think that's what sets it apart from other papers, especially at Oxford, is that we're always looking for new things to do and new ways to create and um, communicate content. There's never really a, a break with this paper, which is good and bad. There's always something that could be done, um, which is really exciting. And yeah, I think that's probably about it. I mean, the masterclasses, I guess, is something that we've all been quite involved in as well. So continuing to ensure that we can get the biggest names, the most relevant names in journalism um, so that they can communicate with our student audience um, and we can continue to like equip writers with the right tools um, and share the right stories from journalists in the field. Um, so as to, I guess, create a paper that is based on learning and refining um, our writing tools um, because that's what the paper is all about. It's about coaching and learning. Mm -hmm. I mean, I can give you guys a, a quick insight into the sort of events term card for the rest of the term, if that's uh, if that would be helpful. I guess um, we've got so yeah on, on our watch before before we depart and uh, ride off into the sunset. Um, uh, the three of us, the rest of the term, we, we have got uh, coming in, I go at, at present coming in, we have uh, the uh, Associate Opinions Editor of the Washington Post, 
who's going to come in and talk to us sort of about um, his role in reporting on Jamal Khashoggi, for which he won the Pulitzer, and more broadly about the US election sort of uh, current affairs more generally. Uh, we've got, um, I believe, the uh, producer of Blue Planet and Planet Earth, um, uh, David Attenborough's old uh, long-time working partner, Alistair Fothergill, um, who's going to come in and talk to us and sort of talk about sort of media from a more sort of uh, production standpoint and give us sort of some insight into some of these sort of most you know, groundbreaking television uh, shows of our time, which are very cool. Uh, we've also got Mary Hockaday, who's the uh, sort of you know, runs the BBC World Service, basically, going to come to give us a sort of international perspective on uh, how the BBC as a domestic broadcaster uh, looks at sort of, you know, international issues and attempts to, uh, you know, put information out to the world about the world, if that makes sense, um, which we're very excited about. Uh, and and that's sort of a baseline of where we are. Um, I, I guess more broadly in answer to the question, um, I'm quite keen to see, uh, as Gabby said, sort of an you know, expansion of viewpoints that we sort of really are able to effectively encompass. Um, hopefully through sort of you know, more international coverage and maybe uh, making students more aware of the sort of the stories maybe they wouldn't necessarily come across um, directly through sort of, you know, uh, uh, a quick browse through the BBC, um, sort of, uh, which is something I think as a, as a paper that you know, given the diversity of the Oxford community is something we should try to do and hope to do in the future. Um, and yeah, more broadly, I, I, I guess the, uh, the I, I, I don't know what, what Bria would, would have to say about this, but just, just, yeah, the, the uh, building on this idea of, of expanding access, and uh, we've got you know various, various, uh, you know, sort of thoughts on how to do this. We look forward to working with the next team to ensure that uh, you know that's that's something that we can continue to push as a paper and really, you know, um, do the best we can for the Oxford community as a whole, and really sort of you know, serve that function as, as an organisation. If that makes sense. Um, yeah, I completely agree with what Adam's just said, and. Um sort of, as I take a, take a step back next time, I, I'd really like to see not, I think, and I think the journalism masterclasses have been very good in sort of showing the breadth of journalism that's, that you can actually get involved in, because I think sometimes when people say the word journalism or journalist, it's very vague and people, you know, don't really understand what practically goes into it or just the sheer breadth of what's involved in in journalism um, and I'd also love to see um, us do more events or put a, sh sort of shine a light on all the other jobs that go that are involved in making any news organization run um, because you know it's not just writers um, or people doing interviews like you guys are there's you know there's illustrators there's I think as Adam knows there's so many people with various aspects of business expertise who go and who need to be involved in getting it in getting it run. And so I think I love to see the blue make journalism a more attractive industry for people who don't who haven't necessarily otherwise considered it because it they don't necessarily know what it involves. Um, and then on more, more of a personal level, I feel like I would love to get involved in some more writing for the blue. Um, specifically, like before I was editor in chief, I was um, senior lifestyle editor. So I, you know, I'd love to write, do some more writing about food, um, sort of expand the creative content that the blue puts out. Um, because I think sometimes we forget, you know, student newspapers aren't just about breaking scandals and, um, you know, the latest JCR gossip, but they're also places where people publish, you know, all the amazing creative stuff they're doing. Um, you know, we've published poems and, you know, long, you know, think pieces and articles about dating and, you know, so th there's an element of fun that, you know, I'd, I'd love to not necessarily bring back, but increase in the paper. Um, thank you for those answers, guys. Um, the next question is, what have the biggest challenges been for each of you in running the blue over the last year or so? Ooh. Where to begin? <laughs> um, okay, so generally, I guess challenges are like, I think probably one of the biggest challenges is disagreements within the team. Um, so obviously, to get where we are, we all have quite large investments in the paper and care about it very deeply. Um, which means that sometimes things come up and we all have different opinions on how to handle that. Um, 
which leads to very long conversations about where best to go with things. Um, so for example, publishing something, writing something up, um, exposing some kind of scandal, anything like that. Um, and, and I think those are the hardest moments for us because we're quite a close knit team. Um, so to have those professional disagreements is sometimes challenging. Um, but I think on the whole, we do deal with them very well. And it comes from a place of like, care about the paper and making sure it does what it's meant to be doing um, and maintains the reputation that we want it to have. Um, so I think that's probably one of the largest challenges is in those moments of crisis, deciding what to do and what the best route forward is. Yeah, I mean, one thing that I've sort of repeatedly said to, to, to Gabby and Breer, which is concerningly accurate, is the fact that I've actually spent more time engaging with, 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 with the two of them than my own family in the past however many months, um, which I've enjoyed doing immensely by virtue of the fact that like they're both lovely people and we all get on very well. And it's all just part of the sort of the broader culture of I guess like like friendliness I'd like to think sort of broadly defines the newspaper and how you will sort of interact within it um so so you know if you're going to disagree with anyone you might as well disagree with someone you get on with and it's like not that deep at the same time obviously you know uh difficult conversations do need to be had as Gabby said so that being said if I was going to disagree with anybody or have a difficult conversation with anyone I'm very glad that it's these two because it's uh <laughs> it's been a lot of fun on that yeah I'd, yeah, I'd, I'd say, you know, fairly similar, even, even when things have been challenging in, in terms of sort of making decisions about, you know, important things, because, you know, generally news, news and journalism in general, people have a lot of stake in what's being said, right? Um, they're often news stories which concern people, you know, real people, or topics that all matter to us. Um, so that's definitely, it's definitely challenging when you have to make those tough decisions. But at the same time, I think it's also, it makes you learn quite a lot about your own decision making ability. Um, I think, so before I took on this role, I think I sort of thought of myself as someone who, you know, likes to take a long time deliberate, deliberating over what should or shouldn't be done. But I think the, you know, the entire process of working in a news organization that deals with fast news and deals with, you know, decisions that need to be made on a daily basis sort of makes you learn that you can trust your instinct and your gut, um, but that you've also got, you know, a huge team of people whose opinions you can really trust um, and who you can have those difficult conversations with and come out at the other end um, having published a great piece of news. Um, so yeah, even though it is, it is definitely challenging sometimes because we live in a, you know, small university, relatively speaking, you know, where the news we, we publish matters, but it's also really fulfilling as well at the same time. It's, it's, it's a difficult balance, but I think that's what sort of the last couple of months have taught me. Thank you. So now for a question a bit more on the lighter side of things. Um, if you weren't editors in chief and managing director, uh, which section of the paper would you want to work for? Well, <laughs> <laughs> um, well, before I like, like I could just said before I, I I used to head up lifestyle, which was a lot of fun. Like because when people generally speaking, when people write for lifestyle, it's stuff they really want to write about. It's not just because they think. So, you know, like politics is interesting, so they should talk about it. You, you know, they generally write stuff that about stuff which is genuinely fun, you know, like like food and, you know, like love and relationships and, you know, haircuts. Um, so I, I definitely had a lot of fun doing that. But if I had to do another section, it would probably be culture, like, you know, along the same sort of wavelength where, generally speaking, people are writing about stuff because they really care about it, you know um and culture can be as deep as you want it to be or it can be about you know the next netflix rom-com so i think it, it would most likely be culture this is where bria and i are like completely different people um, yeah. <laughs> because bria's like lifestyle culture that's very much where her interests lie whereas mine are very much like investigations global affairs current affairs um so we came from different parts of the paper to this job. Um, and I think, I guess like 
where I'm very much like I want I have well I don't want to but I put myself in a very stressful environment um very quickly and somehow get some kind of like high off of that um Bria is very much like happy to just to en enjoy enjoy everything around her and everything she's yeah. consuming um the thing I've missed most about while being an editor-in-chief is being able to write opinion pieces because normally Bria and I or Adam don't write opinion pieces um because of our position in the paper it could potentially be construed as us like us communicating a position that the paper holds as opposed to our own personal opinions um so I'd love to go and write opinion again that's definitely what I've missed as Adam and Brew both know I'm a very opinionated person um so yeah that's what I'm gonna what I'm gonna get back to you're right the, fortunately for us the upside of Gabby not being able to tell the world what she thinks about everything she gets to tell us instead so that's always <laughs> um but yeah no, I to be fair I'm I I was the interview editor last term um on the paper um which has sort of been built into a bigger section this term under Elliot's um, watchful and very competent eye. Um, she's done an absolutely brilliant job with. And I, I, I don't know, maybe, maybe that. Um, I, I, I'd love to work in sort of a bigger interview section and uh, approach some sort of bigger, uh, broader interviews with interesting people who've done some really interesting interviews this term. And it's only a shame to me that I guess in the same way that Gabby can't tell the world what she thinks about, um, you know, whatever it may be on a given day, uh, I, I can't interview interesting people and ask them interesting questions, which uh, I quite enjoy doing. So maybe that, uh, although maybe also likewise, I guess, uh, uh, opinions and, and all that stuff is, uh, we've got loads of really good editors on all of it. So uh, I, I'm sure they're doing a much better job than I could ever do, but maybe yeah, opinions, global affairs, uh, something along those lines uh, would be a lot of fun, I'm sure. Great, that was very interesting to hear, thanks. Um Finally, I would say you've obviously all had different roles within the newspaper. Um, what have been some of your favourite stories that the Blue or you personally have picked up or the ones maybe that you're most proud of? Oh, well, um, I can, I can, I guess, lead off on this to let the others pick between their many insightful stories, <laughs> and interesting things they've said. Um, because obviously I'm much more narrow, boring human being. But um, I I did a really interesting interview with um, James Carville, who is uh, uh, the a sort of democratic political strategist in American politics. Um, uh, was Bill Clinton's uh, sort of uh, chief strategist on his first successful election campaign, um, and is just sort of like one of the most amazing, knowledgeable human beings. Um, with the brain the size of a planet, uh, who sort of is engaged in every single detail of everything going on in US politics, even in sort of approaching, say, the latter end of his career, where he's less actively involved. And I was really lucky to be able to interview him uh, on behalf of the Blue uh, during the sort of the summer term and then going into summer. Uh, and he had a lot of really, really insight, in, insightful things to say, um, but likewise, he's a very in, pin, opinionated man, um, which provided me with some editorial sort of decisions to make in conjunction with others on, on questions of how much uh, of what he said instead of saying sort of variously insensitive, but, but quite entertaining things about just about everybody um, was, you know, we could publish, uh, was simultaneously providing us with some like really interesting content. Uh, and broadly speaking, he made a lot of um, predictions about the American election, which hindsight turned out pretty good. Um, so uh, I, I sort of really enjoyed that. And I'm glad that's something that I was able to do before uh, taking on this job where I now have no opinions and don't think about anything uh, aside from uh, you know those entirely neutral and are respected of the opposite blue. So that 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 was fun before uh, <laughs> before my current role. Um, there are literally so many stories I could tell you. Um, I guess there's like there are so many. I've had so many good good moments at the blue. Um, I think there's two though that really stick out for me. Um, the first being the first article I ever wrote when I was so it was Hillary the end of Hillary last year. Um, it was a really like simple piece, really boring. It was just like something you could watch in lockdown for your degree. Um, so it was just like a really fun piece of writing. Um, but the moment that got published was such a big one for me that like something I'd written could reach that many people. Um, 
And I remember Lois, who was the editor in chief at the time, messaging me to say that she'd really enjoyed it, um, which was like such a big, big moment in my like small fresher brain, um, who hadn't really had any experiences of like any university society. Um, so I think that was probably one of my favorite moments at the blue right at the beginning. Um, and then another, another first, I guess, um, when I was editor in chief, I broke a story on, um, on Christchurch, um, one of their many racism scandals, um, which was a very, very stressful day for me. Like I got the, the tip in the morning and was writing all day and on the phone all day to various people involved. And my day kind of ended being on the phone to someone at the Telegraph and someone at the Daily Mail who wanted to pick up the story. Um, so I think that was kind of the moment where I realized how much we could do, but also how much responsibility we had to communicate things properly and tell the right version of the story. Um, so I think those were the two like big moments for me at the paper in terms of realizing what we could do and feeling really excited about what we could do. Um, for me, I don't necessarily think it's, it would be anything that I've personally written, but I think I'm incredibly proud of the, just the sheer volume of news that we, environmental news that we've published. Cause I remember going into, um, going into this, job I sort of I really wanted us as a paper to be talking more about environmental issues and about sort of you know climate and I think it's some a, a conversation that needs to be happening more frequently in Oxford than it already does um and I I, so, so I think we we hired someone specifically for the job and just seeing just like the number of articles go out um and keeping that conversation going not only, you know, makes me think that, you know, we did a really good job at hiring people, um, but that, that's something that, you know, we've, we've managed to do as a paper in that it's a small thing, but I think it also makes you really proud because I think, especially as, you know, we're halfway through a term now, you can sometimes forget, you know, why you started your job in the first place or in and amongst all the, you know, the stress of it. And then to look back and be like, you know, actually we put out some really good content. Um, yeah, I have one more really, really quick thing to add on that. Um, no, it just, it came to me and I think it's definitely worth mentioning, like the insane work that our investigations team do, um, yeah. because yeah. obviously they don't put out content as frequently as our other sections, but some of the stuff they've done this term is just incredible. Like I remember the first time I saw the doctor's in investigation in its full form, I was, I was on a walk, um, with my boyfriend and I just, I, as we walked, I read him the whole story. Um, and it was just the amount of information they've been able to collect and the diligence with which they've done it. It's one of the best pieces of journalism I've ever seen. And it's a props to their team because they worked collectively on it. It's what we really wanted from our teams is to be collaborative. And I think that was probably the best example of it I've seen this term. Mm -hmm. I feel uh, well, one last person that's worth shouting out um, is probably actually uh, in our time to running the paper, Mole and Opinions has had uh, an enormous amount of, of content because in to deal with by virtue of you know, how keen everyone at Oxford is to produce opinions content, but particularly as a section, opinions is uh, the hardest in terms of turning the line about um, what is acceptable, what is not acceptable, and what do we publish, what do we not, where do we draw the line as editors um, versus you know, moderating someone and you know, what they think about the world and what they have to say. Uh, and that's been uh, something that you know, I think we've done a very good job of. Um, I say we've done a good job of, Mo's done a very good job of with the rest of our team. And I think they just deserve a shout out for uh, the amount of effort and stress that's gone into that um, over the course of uh, the whole summer and now this entire term. And, and yeah, that's, that's been something that's, that's made me uh, consistently proud to be a part of this organisation this year, so the dedication these guys have put into that. So, b b big up the opinions team, basically. Okay, one more shout out, and then I promise I'm done. Because um, I think I think it would be criminal of us to miss the media team of um, it being new this term. It was something we kind of handed over to Anvi and was like, "This is your baby now. 
we want it to happen. We're not really sure what we want it to look like, but we trust you to make it look great. And that's exactly what she's done. Like, I remember her messaging us about the podcast because we had conversations and she's like, okay, we're ready to go with the first episode. And literally we didn't have to do anything. I wish we'd done something because then we could claim yeah. some responsibility. <laughs> um, but we didn't, we haven't done anything. It's just flourished under her, her watchful eye. So they definitely deserve, well, you guys definitely deserve a shout out for that. I didn't, I hear there were a couple of really good people on the media team. Um, I can't remember who they were, but there was definitely. <laughs> They're definitely not on this call. Um, no, that's not, of course well, that no. is probably a very positive, nice self-congratulatory note on which to end on that. Um, thank you everyone for giving us such an insight into the Oxford Blue today. Um, unfortunately, that is all we have time for. Uh, we hope it will encourage many more of you to get involved in student journalism and to check out the paper. You can find us on social media, visit our website, or check out our podcasts and videos on Spotify and YouTube. For now though, thanks for tuning in. Goodbye. Goodbye.